morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Lynch, and for today's Veterans Day program, I will be your master of ceremony. We ask that you please stand for the posting of the colors and remain standing until after the singing of the national anthem. Post the colors. Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight o'er the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there. Oh, say does that star spangled Banner yet wave O'er the land of the free And the home of the Today's invocation will be given by Lewis York.
Blessed be the Lord, my strength, which, reaches my ha- which teaches my hands to war and my fingers to fight, my goodness and my fortress, my high tower and my deliverer, my shield and he in whom I trust, who subdueth my people under me. Psalms 144, 1 through 2. Let us bow our heads. Most gracious Father, we come to you on this special occasion to remember those who have given their youth, their strength, and in many cases, their lives. But first, we honor you, our Supreme Commander-in-Chief. We acknowledge your providence, protection, grace, and love. In this service, help us to properly honor those to whom honor is due. Let us be reminded that we live in the land of the free because of the brave. Thank you for the men and women of our armed forces who have seen combat or worked in support, highly trained and ready to respond to any threat that would jeopardize our liberty. We thank you for their character forged by discipline, tempered by duty, and found faithful in the time of greatest stress. We thank you for their loyalty to our nation, their ongoing contribution to her values, and their compassion for her youth. We thank you that they have found you to be a very present help in times of trouble. We pray for the veterans who have been crippled in war with a lost limb, blindness, deafness, and other lifelong reminders of war. We pray for those injured by the unseen wounds of the mind, those who suffer from PTSD, TBI, and other neurological disorders. We pray for vets in homeless shelters or out on the streets suffering from wounds they do not understand. Give them comfort, protect them from hunger, cold, and cruelty. We pray for those on active duty and those who are in the reserves. We pray for those deployed who have taken up the baton of legacy. Keep them safe, give them hope, let them know that they are loved. Finally, we pray for the families the gold star wives, mothers, and fathers. We ask you to secure marriages that have paid such a high price with multiple deployments. We pray for the children who will miss their moms or dads this holiday. Fill them with your understanding presence and strengthen them now in their time of need. Now as we open this service, open up our hearts in appreciation. We ask in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life a ransom for us all and declared, greater love hath no man than this, than a man lay down his life for his friends. Amen. Please be seated. The president of Columbus Technical College, Ms. Lorette Hoover. Good morning. How are you all? Great. I I realize we have a full auditorium here, but we also have an overflow room, I understand, that is quite full. So I'm very thankful that you are all here today to celebrate Veterans Day at Columbus Technical College. And today is, did you hear on the radio this morning, if you didn't already know, the 100th anniversary of the Marine Corps. So it really is a special, special day. Raw. There we go. Um, I would like to bring you welcome, and I'll keep my comments short because we have some awesome speakers that will be coming on the stage in a moment. First, I'd like to say many, many thanks to our Student Veterans Association for putting on today's program and the staff that assisted them. And I have just a couple of requests, and it's going to cause some action for you, so pay attention. If um, you are a student and a veteran. Would you please stand so we can see you and thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Columbus Technical College uh, serves the most veterans in the technical college system in Georgia. or. We're number two because Savannah Tech took the role. Can you tell it's a little bit of a competition? My dear friend Kathy Love and I, we will call each other after every semester of Sedgeray and say, how many do you have? Well, I have this many. And it brings me um, nothing but pleasure when uh, I'm able to share that we have more than they do. Uh, Being associated by Fort Benning is part of it, uh, but we also started new programs on base, which really allowed 
um, the opportunity for individuals to attend Columbus Technical College. We have a training program at the Armor School. Those are the individuals, the soldiers, who learn how to repair tanks and Allen Badley fighting vehicles. We accept all their MOSs as college credit. We provide them five general education classes and they have an associate degree. So one day when they exit, not only will they have their MOSs and their military experience, but they'll have this civilian associate degree that future employers will know and understand. And that's vital as they make the transition to civilian life. Um, and then we also teach classes at Martin Army Community Hospital. We've had a medical program there, and we are uh, going to start a licensed practical nursing program there as soon as we get the approval uh, to do so. Uh, but they are working with us on clinical sites and supporting our students that way as well. And uh, we're also at the Maneuver Center of Excellence. But if you're an old dependent like me, that, that's the old building four. <laughs> and we're happy to be there as well. So now let me ask real quick, um, out of our employees, if you serve the military, would you please stand so we can have an idea how many of our employees serve the military? And wave your hand if you're already standing, because I know we've got several in the back. And I don't want to miss, because sometimes when I say veterans, they think I'm excluding active duty, and I'm not. So are there any active duty students or employees? I knew we had at least some. There we go. Very good. Thank you. Now, I know I mentioned I was a military brat. Um, brats support their families. And we have to adjust to numerous moves and, and different environments and different cultures. And so I would like to ask how many dependents of uh, service uh, men and women are in the room, spouse or children. St stand up real quick so we can see and look on YouTube for a second. Thank you so much. I don't know if you saw the people standing, but by the time the vets, the active duty, the students, uh, the employees stood, I think we got almost uh, probably at least three-fourths of the room, which is very, very cool and represents our statistics at Columbus Technical College. Um, the reason why I wanted everyone to stand is, is because you who make this country great. Uh, it does not matter your gender, your national origin, your race, your religion. It does not matter if you're Republican or Democratic or Independent. These individuals supported your ability to have the right to believe the way you do. They've given us our freedom, and that's why we're here to celebrate today. Um, I would like to take a moment and introduce some special guests. Um, I won't introduce the speakers because they will have a formal introduction shortly. But I would like to say hello to Richard Smith, a representative for the state of Georgia. Just, just give away real quick, Richard. Thank you so much for coming today. And I would like to recognize retired Master Sergeant Glenn Murphy, veteran of World War II, and my dear friend. I'd also like to ask retired Master Sergeant Johnny Howard to stand. I didn't see him come in, so I might have missed him. And then I'm curious if Solomon Brown is in the room. They might be joining us late. He's another World War II vet. Well, you are in for a treat today. We have two marvelous speakers, two marvelous statesmen, and uh, you will enjoy today's program. Thank you for coming. Enjoy the program, and we love our veterans. Happy Veterans Day. Thank you, Ms. Hoover. The introduction of our two guest speakers by Terry Bush. Good afternoon. Our first guest speaker is Representative John Yates. Representative Yates of District 73 is the last World War II veteran in the Georgia legislature. Representative Yates entered the Army as a private and three and a half years later, he became a captain. His military service included extensive service during the Battle of the Bulge, which was noted as the greatest battle of the war. Representative Yates was the first Republican candidate for the House ever elected in Spalding County. He began serving in 1989. 
was defeated in the next election, but won a landslide victory in the following term and will remain in office until January next year. His long service to the state and military experience worked to help secure Representative Yates' appointment as the chairman of the Defense and Veterans Affairs Committee. Chairman Yates is also a member of the Voice of Veterans, an organization that speaks to children about patriotism. He also holds membership in the Appropriations, Reapportionment, and Motor Vehicles Committees. His most important achievement has been enhancing education by gaining budget support for teaching at Griffith Campus UGA and similar support for Griffin Technical College and Gordon College, where he is also of the College Foundation. Ladies and gentlemen, Representative John Yates. But he gave most of my speech. <laughs> I, I would like to emphasize um, that I, my main purpose in life in the last few years and continues, even though I'm going to retire shortly, uh, as I say, I'm 94. Uh, you haven't known anybody in 94? Uh, <laughs> Let me tell you, it's not that bad. I climbed the steps in the Capitol where I'm, I used to say my fat buddies take the elevator, but somebody told me fat is politically incorrect, so I said overextended buddies take the elevator. <laughs> you could tell why I've lasted this long. I have a great sense of humor. I almost never miss seeing something funny. And it's a great way to be because life goes by much better, smoother, that way. And I, uh, as I, I continue to do that. I live, uh, unfortunately, my, uh, my dear wife of many, many years, uh, she, she didn't follow the doctor's orders like me. She kept eating that cake, and I kept pushing it aside. So she left me a few years ago, and... So now I'm in the house by myself, and I got kids and grandkids and great grandkids. And since I, every time I got a promotion at Ford Motor Company, I was manager of the parts distribution center in Los Angeles, third largest depot. Uh, I went across the country, and every time they promoted me, uh, I, uh, you know, got got more money and whatever, and got a better job. And but uh, as I say. Uh, I'm, I'm by myself now, more or less, in the house, and it's a big house, a beautiful house. And uh, but I take in uh, every vagrant in the world that needs a needs a place to spend the night. I was telling some tales about s some people I knew, and some people think I'm crazy. I'm taking a chance, but I can't turn down people in need. And uh, there's a great need out there, and if you want to make life more interesting, just help some people. And uh, there's a lot of people need help, and I've, I've done my share, and I can sleep very well at night because I, I don't have a guilty conscience about anything. I don't know of anybody I've mistreated that, uh, that I'd like to go back and redo again. But I've, I, I, my whole life is right now is emphasizing education. And uh, um, some fellow at the Georgia State uh, is... He's going to help me write a book and, uh, about my life, and uh, I hope I can get it all down and everything, and, and uh, some people might be interested in seeing some of these tales I got. Uh, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't leave you with the, my most famous tale that all my friends want me to tell about. Uh, yeah, I was at the Battle of the Bulge, famous battle of World War II in Belgium, and there was a German Tiger Royal tank, 80-ton tank. That's a monster, with a, with a big 88 gun on it. And it was sitting so close to the front lines, it was three feet of snow on the ground. It was so close to the front lines, they wouldn't let me shoot artillery. You know why? Troops don't, our troops don't like friendly fire. <laughs> 
Friendly fire is your own artillery. <laughs> so uh, they wouldn't let me shoot at this tank. And it had three feet of snow, and it would sit there day after day after day. And so we didn't ask anybody. It's me and my observer who sits in the back seat and calls the directions down to fire direction center. Uh, we didn't ask anybody's permission. We just decided to do something about it. So he took a five-gallon can of gasoline and put it on the wing strut of the Piper Cub, and we flew in about 100 feet above the tank. And the wind was high, and so he dropped it a little bit early, and it missed the tank about like that. But when it hit the ground, the tank driver must have thought it was an artillery dud, and he backed up 100 feet. <laughs> that was his demise. And so... We called in new directions, and this guy knew how to shoot artillery as good as I did. You know, when you shoot artillery, you get an over and a short, and then you go into fire for effect. Well, I called out around, and he backed up right where that one had hit. Then I called down another, and he'd come up to where that one had hit. So I told him, I said, put two straight along the same spot. And... So me and my observer went up there in a Jeep and, a, and looked at the area around the tank after it had happened. We wanted to see what happened. And so it had punched his radiator and knocked his track off. And so we was keeping quiet about this. And the next thing I knew, the, gen the general called up and said, how did the experiment turn out? So I just had one thing to say. I said, well, we in Bastogne, Belgium, aren't we? <laughs> so that, uh, you know, I, I often wondered why they paid me extra money for flying an airplane when it's so much fun. <laughs> but then I happened to think it, sometimes I did get shot at. So <laughs> I knew there was a reason why they gave me that extra money. The airplane got hit a few times by rifles. You know, we were pretty vulnerable up there, sitting up there. And didn't you have armor plate? No, I had a buddy that he he he, he saw a P-47 pursuit plane that got shot down. He went over and took the armor plate out. He always had a fear of being shot in the butt. <laughs> so he put that armor plate under his seat, under his seat. And he was the other pilot in my battalion, so he was really m my guy. Well, guess what? He was flying at the front lines, and the word got back that he had sh been shot down, and I had to go up and retrieve our airplane. So my driver drove me up to the front. I went up and looked at the airplane, and guess what? The rifle bullet had gone in about that far above the armor plate. And the bullet went in him, went through each of his big intestine, small intestine, stomach. And he had presence of mind to land. And I went up and got the airplane. And I guess the good news for him, he spent the rest of the war in Pontiac, Michigan, because there's no more duty on him. And I fought the rest of the war, and uh, then I was in the Army of Occupation and flew all over the uh, Europe, uh, just waiting for my time to come home. They, a they asked me if I want to go to Korea, and I said, do I look that stupid? <laughs> so anyway, I didn't go to Korea, and I stayed in the Army of Occupation in Europe, and it was very eventful thing. I was flying all over the place. I had no boss, um, you know, and just uh, waiting for my turn. And uh, I decided to fly into Czechoslovakia. And I and uh, and they had a over in that part of Ger Germany next close by. They had one of the most famous uh, death camps for the Jews. And it changed my life. It really did because I, it was long since vacant, of course. 
But when I went in there and looked at the death chambers and saw how those poor people died, it, it really hurt me. So later on, when I went got back to the legislature, they had a, a person up there who, had, uh, who was uh, in charge of the, that. And I signed up with her, and I went around and made speeches against uh, that kind of treatment of people and uh, and and uh, got kind of really kind of famous around the parts up there of making speeches against that kind of treatment of any member of any race. I mean, it's just it was such a horrible thing. So I just said all of that to say that those are some of the things that have shaped my life, and I'm very satisfied with my life now. I say it's kind of bad to be without a lot of my family members, but. Uh, I don't know how long I'll live, uh, maybe 10 more years. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, you got to have a plan, right? <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how. I'm still, I'm still going to climb the steps in the Capitol for all y'all who are interested. And uh, still, I walk every day at home. I got a beautiful, uh, I got swimming pool. I got uh, walking trails. I got a fish pond with two and a, two and a half acres with all kind of fish. I saw a catfish in there one time. It was six feet long. <laughs> I think I think I let him stay in too long. What do you think? <laughs> when, I, when I go down there and feed him with throw out floating catfish food, he just opens that big mouth about that wide and just vacuums it off the top of the water. <laughs> I hate to make y'all jealous, but I've I've got the most beautiful place in the world, <laughs> and. Uh, Y'all can come down and visit me, 961 Birdie Road. And uh, Birdie is named for my cousin, Birdie Elder. Uh, so we are, we're big kin folks, folks, you know. I, I got relatives everywhere and uh, love all of them. And uh, I wish I had time for question and answer. I'd like to talk to you people. But, uh, and and I, I want to say that I'm all about education. I have, if you ask anybody in the business, there's nobody has worked harder on Griffin Campus University of Georgia is one of those places. Gordon College Foundation. Uh, I'm on the Gordon College Foundation. And, uh, and I will do anything I can, education. And, of course, my days are the number. I can't vote no more up there. But I, I ask the legislators that here or whatever, stick to that. We got, I think we've got the... I've, I've heard this said, our technical school systems are the best in the world. And y'all, and when you think back, what I had to do to get an education, you know, walk to Sunnyside School, and then when I went through college, Georgia, I went through uh, I, I, six years of night school working unlimited overtime at Ford Motor Company with three kids at home, and I want, want to spend time with them, and a wife that said, when are you going to get through with education? And she was all for it, of course, because obviously you make more money when you get educated. And uh, so it's, I want to say like this program that I, this, 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 my favorite movie, It's a Wonderful Life. How many of y'all saw that movie? That is the greatest movie that ever was written. And guess what? I went down to Long Beach, California when I was living in Seal Beach and went to that, me and my wife went to the movie and we sat down on the third row and looked around and guess who was sitting the next row back of us watching a sneak preview of his own movie, the main actor and his wife was sitting right back of me and I, I didn't want to bother them by autographs, but I did turn around and shake hands with him. And, he, and they, have, they were my favorite people. And I, I wish I had time for question and answer, but I did, I'd love to be with y'all today. And I thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'll keep working until the day I die to help education, help people. And, uh, and I will look around and see all these friends, like these two gentlemen on the front here. And uh, I'm glad that they, you're going to continue educate that young man. So thanks so much for everything.
Thank you, Representative Yates. Our next speaker is Senator Ed Harbison. Senator Harbison of Columbus was first elected to the Senate from the 18th, or sorry, the 15th District in 1992. Senator Harbison represents the citizens of Macon, Marion, Talbot, Taylor, and Schley counties, as well as portions of Chattahoochee and Muscogee counties. He was born in Prattville, Alabama, raised in Montgomery. Senator Harbison graduated from the Career Academy School of Broadcasting and attended Troy University at Fort Benning. He served four years in the U.S. Marines and is a recipient of the Purple Heart. Senator Harbison is the chairman of the State Institutions and Property Committee. He is a ranking member of the Banking and Financial Institutions, Insurance and Labor, Interstate Cooperation, Reapportionment and Redistricting, and Ethics Committees. He also serves as Vice Chair of Veterans, Military and Homeland Security Committee, and is ex officio of the Regulated Industries and Utilities Committee. Senator Harbison helped designate Georgia as a Purple Heart State and successfully sponsored a bill making life easier for children of military families. He established a court for veterans in Georgia and established the Military Hall of Fame as well. Senator Harbison is a life member of the Disabled Veterans, Military Order of the Purple Heart, Veterans of Foreign Wars, and National Infantry Association. He also holds the rank of major in the legislative branch of the Civil Air Patrol. Ladies and gentlemen, Senator Ed Harbison. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it morning or afternoon? Morning. I get lost in those great stories told by John Yates. Let's give him another round of applause. He is. I can listen to him all day. He's uh, one of my good friends, and I just want to, at this time, also acknowledge my very good friend, uh, Richard Smith, uh, Chairman Smith, who holds a very high rank, and those uh, laws you heard uh, being passed by myself was uh, equally responsible by this gentleman right here, Richard Smith. Let's give Richard Smith another round of applause. Good friend. I, I too am very glad to be here today. I, I went the other way. I was telling uh, Chairman Yates about how I come to join the service years ago, and I, I, I don't know how it happened, but I have a friend of mine. We call him Papa, Hot Papa. And uh, when we graduated from high school, for me, graduating from high school was like going to college because I was the first uh, graduate in my family. It was just tough. Not so much academically, but economically, because a lot of the time the children had to get out and go to work. And if you didn't go to work, the, 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 the family suffered. But the point of it was uh, when I finished high school, rather than going to college, uh, my good friend uh, Papa hot papa, as we call him, said, look, man, uh, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to the Army, get my military duty out of the way and, and come back and go to college. And he said, well, why are you doing that? I said, well, I want to get serve my country, and it serves two purposes, give me a little experience and save a little money, and I get out and I can go, go to college I want to go to. He said, no, you don't want to do that. He said, what you want to do is go to the Marines, man. I said, why do I want to go to the Marine? No, I'm going to the Army. I don't want to go to the Marine. How many, how many years they got to serve? They do four years. I said, well, why do I want to do that? He said, look, man, let me tell you something. Let me hit you to the scene. He said, let's, let's do this. Compare this. You go to the Army, you do two years, you get out. All your buddies, all they all go to the Army, get out and do two years. When you go to the Marines, man, look here. We travel all over the world. We get those sharp uniforms, man. We get girls. <laughs> and, and we get girls. Don't be a fool, man. And he kept putting this in my ear, putting it in my ear. And finally, I said, okay. I said, okay. We get the uniform. We get the uniform. Man, I tell you what, I joined the Marine Corps. My drill instructor called me every name but a child of God. <laughs> every name. I mean, I can't even say it in this audience. I mean, every name. And, and to add insult to injury, I had to pay for the uniform. <laughs> I had to pay for the uniform. And to add insult to injury, six months after joining the Marine Corps, I was in Vietnam and they were shooting at me. <laughs> I shot back, of course. I shot back. The point of it is, you know, 
And sometimes God leads you in a different way, and that was a different kind of angel, and I believe in God. So uh, Papa, Hot Papa, uh, had a message for me that uh, had a lasting message for me. He, he, re he uh, retired from the Postal Service. He survived the war. He was an M60 machine gunner, and every time I see him, I have some choice words for him, but... <laughs> Uh, but he understands now we're good friends. My, his mom and my mom were best friends. Uh, my mom is 92 years old. She uh, uh, was a warrior, one of the soldiers of the, of the bus boycott of 1954. She was a maid, not an environmental engineer. She was a maid. And she walked to work during very tough times. And we've learned that kind of thing from two great women in my family, my mother and my grandmother. As a matter of fact, my grandmother was the first drill instructor in my life. Uh, my, Mama Annie was tough as nails, so I had, when I went to boot camp, it wasn't as hard as I anticipated because Grandmama was tough. Number one, she believed in God, and if you lived in a house, you were going to believe in God, too. And you learned to say amen and thank you, Jesus, you know what I mean? <laughs> if, you, if you wanted her to stop whipping on you and that kind of stuff. But uh, I'm, I'm just honored to be here today. I just want to thank uh, Columbus Technical College and the president here, President Hoover, uh, for uh, putting on this today. And more importantly, thank all the veterans out there who served the country and did the great things you did, went to the far places and fight those battles that our country had us fight. And I'm just honored that you're here, whether you're in the Air Force, Army, Marines, Navy, or Coast Guards. I just want to say thank you so much. And believe this or not, we fight for you every day in the Georgia General Assembly. We understand that you go from post to post, that your children have to go with you, that your wife or your husband, they have to go with you, and we try to make it as easy as possible. That's why we pass those laws that say that if you are in Kansas, if you're in Missouri, Alabama, wherever you are, if you have a child that's in school and they have certain records, when they come here, they don't have to repeat those records. If they had Massachusetts history, they come here, they do not have to take Georgia history. That's just common sense, isn't it? Ain't nothing wrong with common sense. And I think those kinds of laws we pass because we care about our military. We understand that BRAC comes around. And believe me, you do not want to lose Fort Benning. You do not want it to downsize. And we have very capable commanders out there, very capable members of the chambers of commerce in this state that fight every day for our veterans and make sure that we appreciate the current members of our military because you go to far places and fight those wars. I remember uh, being on an operation that sort of took me home, and it affects you. It, it, it really affects you. And at first, I didn't realize it did. But I've had people that tell me, say, look, man, uh, uh, look, this happened to me, and I, I feel this way, and I got this anger issue. When I got back, I took the uniform off. I've been to Vietnam three times, 0311. I think in the Army, that's 11 Bravo. That means that you shoot at people, and they shoot at you. We destroy and break things. We blow them up and shoot at people. We do those kinds of things. But when I got out, I took the uniform off. And I paused for a moment, and I say a moment, like six months. And then I went back into the market. I said, that didn't affect me. Everything's fine, you know. But I had friends of mine who tell me that that's always not true because a lot of times with you with a wife or you with a husband, you wake up, guess what? You wake up still in Vietnam. That It's the gift that keeps on giving. So PTSD is real. And so those who don't be ashamed of it because we denied it. I, we were like, I mean, I'm not going to sick bay talking about, I, you know, I got the shakes and I woke up screaming or something like that. But please be aware of the fact that you could be helped. There are things out there, programs out there for you. Uh, the country is for you. The community is for you. I'm for you. We all for you because we understand whether you're a man or woman now. Uh, that you, if you're in uniform, you're in a combat situation, we understand that there are things that can happen to you, and it goes on and on. I would wake up in, uh, in, in a sweat thinking I was still in Vietnam because my wife said I would wake up and I'm lying very still. And when I wake up, I don't move because I may be in ambush, L-shaped ambush or something, and I don't want to move until I find out where the enemy is. And that kind of thing happens all the time. Those of us who've been in those situations know that that is basically the truth. 
Uh, the thing on Hastings, I'll say this and I'll sit down. The one of the things that, that visited us, Operation Hastings was probably Hastings was probably one of the largest battles the Marines had. Where we uh, up near Camlo, I think we came out of Camlo and way in those areas, and we invaded the Vietnam and we launched Operation Hastings. But on that, there were men and women, I, I, men out there fighting, and. Uh, they, they were dying and screaming, and war is something that you don't want to you don't want to be in. I'm, I just tell you that war is something that those of us who've been there you don't want to easily invite that kind of thing. So that's why I pray every day that you never have to go to those situations. That we in our country never have to have that kind of thing walking down your street and have to fear that you're going to get shot or somebody's going to shoot you or there's an ambush out there because you have a strong army, you have a strong marine, we have a strong military force out there who protect our country, who make sure we go over there and not have that same kind of crazy thing happen right here in the great United States of America. This is a great country. I don't care what anybody says about it. And we don't have revolutions, we have elections, right? That's what it's all about. If you don't understand that, you don't understand anything. We have got to stay on course, we got to stay focused, and don't lose perspective, because it's about each one teach one, each one care one, and each one understand that you gotta walk a mile in my shoes. Because America is not just for black people, white people, men, women, it's for everybody. It's the greatest country in the world, and we, the people, make it that way because we understand that we care about one another. We have to keep doing that. We come through a difficult election. I know it. It's all right, but we'll get through that too, won't we? We will endure. We will continue to be the home of the brave and home of the free because this is America, and I think our foundation is deeper, wider, and broader than that narrow view that we want to perpetrate against one another. We are, we are good people. We all, uh, we all came out of good environments. I was telling you about Hastings. What, it, what that was about, it taught me that my friends that I sneaked off and went to where my drill instructor told me not to go, went to Tijuana. <laughs> and the driller said, don't go to Tijuana. And of course, the very first place we go, soldiers, Tijuana, right? Tijuana. When I went to Honolulu, Hawaii, the first place they told us not to go, don't go to Hotel Street, first place we went, Hotel Street, because they told us don't go there, but we said, that's where the action is, that's where we're going. No fear, no fear, 18, 19, 20 years old. So uh, you, you bond with people. Joel Bernstein, my good buddy, the first person I lost in Vietnam was Joel Bernstein. I think about Joel every day almost. Ralph Ortega, Operation Hastings, kill in action. And we would swap stories about what we we're gonna do when we get out. He liked to golf. His family called me to this day and talk about it. My other good friend, uh, that his sister moved to Columbus, Georgia. Dennis Eaker, these are real people, you can, you can look it up. Dennis died, uh, we were all just buddies. It was about four or five of us. We were all, all parts of all races or from all parts of the country, but we were tight buddies. But they get killed and then you understand the loss that you feel. You understand that war is real and it's fatal and you have to make sure that you look out for your buddy. It's not necessarily all the time about you're fighting for your country, you're fighting for your buddy. And that's where we have to look at one another. This is a community of people, different people, and we're stronger because of it. We, we love each other. We got to learn to love each other and accept each other what we are. But don't, we don't have to lose our values because in the, in the Marine Corps, on Operation Hastings, the blood was all red. Blood was all red, folks, and we got to remember that and stand for the red, white, and blue. God is good. He prevails. Thank you so much, and God bless you. Appreciate you. Thank you, Senator. America's White Table, presented by Burton Stewart, Staff Sergeant Rosemond Dahiti. America's White Table, 
The table honors the men and women who served in the America's armed forces. The table is round to show our everlasting devotion and concern for our fallen and missing comrades. The cloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their motives when answering the call to duty. The single red rose displayed in a vase remind us of the life and the blood that was shed and their loved ones and friends who keep the faith and await answers. The vase is tied with a red ribbon, symbol of our commitment and continued determination to account for our missing. A slice of lemon on the plate is to remind us of the bitter fate of those captured and missing in a foreign land. The salt is to remind us of the tears endured by those missing and their families who still seek answers. The black napkin is a reminder of the isolation, deprivation, and cruel fate of our missing. The glass is inverted to symbolize their inability to share this day, evening, with us. The chair is empty and tilted. They are not here and will remain so until they return or accounted for. You are not forgotten so long as there is one left in whom your memory remains. A Brief History of Veterans Day, presented by Ms. Barbara Gaither. Good morning or afternoon. Um, first of all, I'd just like to say that I have been inspired and blessed by both of um, our guest speakers today. I think everybody here would agree with me on that, and, and that was, that's been an exciting part of the day, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to talk to you just a little bit about the historical significance of Veterans Day. I think everyone knows that uh, Veterans Day on November the 11th is to honor our veterans, but many don't know that historical significance. At the 11th hour on the 11th day of the 11th month of 1918, World War I came to an end. And the following year, President Woodrow Wilson commemorated that event with the first Armistice Day recognition. Um, though it was set aside initially to honor veterans of World War I, it soon became clear with the advent of World War II and the Korean War that this needed to be expanded and to be a time to memorialize and me remember veterans of all of these wars. In 1954, Congress changed the name from Armistice Day to Veterans Day, and it became a day to honor all veterans of all wars. For many years after that, Veterans Day was moved around on the calendar, I think in some ways to make it convenient for people. Um, it was even moved to uh, late September at one point, moved into October, and celebrated on different arbitrary days. In 1978, President Gerald Ford signed a law bringing the remembrance of Veterans Day back to November 11th to honor its original significance. Veterans Day is not only a time to honor those who have died in service to our great country, but it's also a time to recognize those who have served and those who continue to serve today. I know that we've already done this once, but collectively we would like to have all veterans stand and be recognized. Thank you.
Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, we would like to make a special presentation presented by our president, Ms. Lorette Hoover and Ms. Bernita Harris. I um, have the distinct opportunity to thank our speakers one more time. And as I um, step down to share with them a special presentation, if there are members of the Student Veterans Association, would you please stand so we can see who you are and thank you for today because it was a lovely, lovely event. Just beautiful. In addition to planning today and inviting our speakers and special guests, the Student Veterans Association has also decided to uh, present a scholarship in your honor to a veteran. And so what I'm presenting you is just an acknowledgement of that scholarship. So Senator Harbison, thank you so much for coming today. We would like to uh, give you a second to see that you are I have a scholarship in your honor at Columbus Technical College. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Same for you. We have a scholarship in your honor at Columbus Technical College, and our foundation will be submitting the application, and anyone who's a vet can apply. Do you want a group picture real quick? Because I know Betsy. Y'all don't mind a photo op real quick, do you? <laughs> Yeah. Very good. Very good. Very good. And she's right there. Uh oh. Glasses. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. We thank you again, sir. In addition. In addition, we would like to um, present um, Representative Yates as well as Senator Harbison with some additional parting gifts. This is a certificate of appreciation for participating in our Veterans Day celebration. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you. Appreciate Thank you so much. Appreciate it. We're also prepared to present you with each of you. Um, we're, we, we will be presenting a charitable donation to each of your favorite charities in your name. I'll be back next year. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Please stand for the playing of taps and the retirement of the colors. Retire the colors. March time, March, Cups, 
Help! Present arms. Order arms. Retrieve colors. Center face. Forward march. March sign, march. Forward march. At this time, please permit our distinguished speakers to depart. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. However, lunch will be served across the street in the Heartline Building, room 158, which is our Veterans Lounge. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.